So right now you think that the, the wallets own the user experience. But actually, if you go a level even above, which is the browsers themselves, not the browser extensions, but the browsers themselves, they can own the browser extensions. They can own the MetaMasks of the world. So if they try to, to build their own wallet and uh, within their browsers, and if their browsers are really successful, they're going to own all the power. They're, they're going to become the, 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 the de facto aggregator of uh, experiences. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Empire. We've got Santi co-hosting, and we have a repeat guest, or maybe for the third time. I forget if it's the second or the third time, but we've got Chow uh, from Alliance Dow back in action. Chow, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. Of course. Of course. Really excited about it. New, new year going well? Very well. Had a great... Uh, Took a break, uh, first break for since like a year or so. So it was very refreshing. What, what, is a, what does a break look like to you? Well, usually uh, I go overseas with my wife on a, on a vacation, but this year was the second year I became a father, father so I couldn't go out. Uh, so I stayed home, uh, did some creative art, uh, trained my left brain uh, for like <laughs> very rarely. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. Baby, babies are definitely good for the left brain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's awesome. Man. I see you've got a new uh, video camera and mic too. It's yeah. going to be a big year for the podcast for you, I, uh, I expect. Yeah, same, same setup as uh, Joe Rogan. Uh, wow, well. look at you. <laughs> look at you. <laughs> I've always put you in the same, uh, same bucket as Joe Rogan, Chow. That is, uh, that's the first person that comes to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm, I'm super excited about this, uh, about this conversation. People who have listened to Empire for the last couple of weeks have heard Santi and I talking about like thoughts on the past year, thoughts for the next year. And um, one thing that I've been bringing up a lot is like this fat wallet thesis, the wallet wars, kind of on, on this idea that like every couple of years there are there's just a battle and there's a war uh, for the for the for the users, right? In 2017, we had exchanges. 2021, we had the L1s, and I think that the next kind of proverbial war that we see in crypto is around is around the wallets. Um, and I think you were one of the first people to kind of put this idea in my head, and you're one of the only other people who I've seen talking about what I feel like is an overlooked place in crypto, which is which is wallets. So I'd love to just hear you. Maybe if we could start high level, and would love to hear your thesis for why you think. That this kind of fat, we'll call it the fat wallet thesis, yeah. is uh, is impending. Yeah, the uh, where I um, had this insight, it, it was a, it was actually a while ago. It was probably a year or two ago, uh, sometime after DeFi summer. Um, I realized that uh, MetaMask implemented a swap function within the browser extension itself, and since then I found myself start using that swap function natively within MetaMask without having to go to Uniswap or any other AMMs. And the sacrifice I had to make was paying 1% or something like that, something ridiculous to, to uh, MetaMask. Um, but whatever, it, it doesn't matter because uh, crypto is a 150 vol asset, asset class, right? Paying 1% off of that doesn't really affect the user. So over time, I realized, holy shit, wallets are really, really powerful, especially by wallets, I mean specifically the consumer-facing wallets, uh, whether it's browser extensions or mobile apps, um, because they own the end-user relationship. And that's basically the crypto version of the aggregation theory. If you own the end-user relationship, you can build anything into your browser extension or mobile app, right? The case with uh, um, the MetaMask was that they, they built swap function, but we're seeing um, you know other um, wallets doing something similar. So that's mm -hmm. where this thesis came about. Before we talk into like value accrual for wallets and like what these wallet wars would look like, why don't you actually go back in time? So I've used MetaMask for years. I also remember using like my Ether wallet back in the day. Yeah. Um, I think, that, I think that was Tay's thing, um, Taylor Monahan before, I think she's now at MetaMask, but would love to just hear like the history of wallets if you feel set up to talk about that and, yeah. then, and then that'll take us into the future. I mean, I can go as back as to like Mount Gox, which is, which let's is the- go. Let's go, let's <laughs> go, yeah, let's go there. That the, sounds great. The, the very first wallet I used was Mount Gox, uh, for better or worse, was the centralized, I mean, if you want to call it even a wallet, uh, but it, this was the first place where I stored uh, my Bitcoin, which a part, a small part of my Bitcoin, which eventually, uh, 
went to nothing. Uh, so Mangos still owes me a, a bunch of uh, a bunch of BTC. <laughs> uh, uh, by the way, that that um, liquidation process has taken like a, almost a decade now. But anyway, um, but the second wallet, as soon as I bought Mangox or uh, <laughs> bought Mangox, bought, bought BTC on, uh, from Mangox and transferred most of it into a uh, paper wallet, uh, BTC paper wallet. So the, the way it works is you open, a, uh, you open a website and you move your mouse in a, as random as possible way to generate uh, a private key. And you would then disconnect your computer from the internet and then print the private key out. And that's how you store the BTC back in the day. That's what I did. That was the, the paper wallet. Um, and then 2014, uh, Ethereum came around. 2016, I think that was when my Ether wallet, might have been 2017, but 2016, I started using some Ethereum-based wallets. Um, and the thing that, that was fundamentally different from Bitcoin was that with Ethereum, you can now start accessing some apps, okay? So you, cannot no, you can no longer use a paper wallet to access decentralized applications. So you either have to use um, later on um, MetaMask with a hard wallet behind, um, or you use my Ether wallet, which back in the day had some built-in functions within the, the website. So within the website, the, my Ether wallet website, there was a few dApps that were built in um, so you could access that. But MetaMask was the thing that was really the, the game changer because with my Ether wallet, you can access any app you want because everything had to be predefined, built in within the, applica within the website. With MetaMask, the moment you install a browser extension, you can access any de ap decentralized ap application as you want. So MetaMask was really the, um, the game changer for me in 2017, 2018, when there was... Um, you know, new decentralized applications like uh, MakerDAO. MakerDAO was the first DApp that I really tried and used uh, using MetaMask with a hardware wallet behind. And that has been pretty much my, my own user experience since then. So MetaMask has really owned the wallet experience for the user over the last several years. What's wrong with MetaMask today? <sighs> well, I mean, I can talk about... Besides that, have... have Aside from, aside from the fact that half my transactions fail these days, I feel like, but... Uh. Yeah, that, that's, that's, precisely, that's precisely my number one pain point, is, which is the, the transactions failing all the time. Um, especially post-1559, uh, for whatever mm -hmm. reason, I just started seeing, uh, experiencing a bunch of uh, failed transactions. Um, but in general, um, there's couple problems outside of that, maybe for other users. One I noticed is that for new users who are, you know, start to dabble, dabble into the decentralized, the real decentralized world, um, they need protection. They need, like whenever they sign a transaction, they, they need some kind of warning to prevent them from falling into like phishing attacks or you know, outright, you know, scams, like, you know, smart contracts that are, you know, pull rug, or rug pulls and stuff like that, right? Um, so I think a lot of wallets are thinking about that today. Uh, and there's a lot of startups building uh, smart contract scam detection products for wallets to, in, to be integrated within wallets. Um, but that's work in progress. That's one of the biggest things that I think is missing today. Um, and the other thing is just mobile experience. Um, uh, there, needs, there just needs to be a really good mobile wallet. Yeah. What's your... Like, what's your vision here of where of where this goes? Is this like the su a super app? Like a wa a wallet will be a super app, and then and then after that, I want to talk about like how we actually get there and the strategies and like who's competing with MetaMask. But maybe take us to your your end state here. Is this a super app that kind of looks like what we have in Latin America and and, and Asia? Um, what 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 is this? What are we building here? The trend I'm seeing right now is very much going into the super app uh, vision, which is similar to to WeChat, for example. You have one app where you can talk to people. You can send transactions. You can use a bunch of other apps within the super app, such as you know using a, a Uber, finding like hotels and stuff like that. Um, and again, this goes back to my original observation with MetaMask. 
uh, which integrated, which built the, the swap function within the browser extension itself. And we're seeing other wallets doing the same thing, for example, with Phantom doing something similar on, on Solana. Um, they all try to add these commonly used, frequently used functions within the app itself. So, so they start with trading, which is the most obvious uh, use case, but then later they might add like lending or some popular games or whatever. Um, so this is the trend I'm seeing right now. And I suspect that will be the end vision. Hmm. It's interesting. Like crypto side, I feel like this is something that US companies are now using as a marketing tactic is like the super app, right? Where you start with um, like a single wedge product that is an order of magnitude better than alternatives, alternatives at the time, whether it's like cash app for P2P payments or like PayPal, like online payments. This was like more like web one, uh, like Robinhood, commission free trading, Coinbase, like user friendly crypto. You start with this product that's this like orders of magnitude better. And then you're like, oh, wait, where, where, where do I go next? And then you're like, wait a minute. Uh, like WeChat is the super app. That sounds like a sexy thing that'll help me raise money. And like, I started seeing it on all the financial apps. Like I Revolut, I remember the day they changed their homepage to like, we're building a super app or like the PayPal CEO came out and he's like, our new PayPal mission is like, we're building a super app. Uh, it does feel like kind of this overhyped term to me. So I'm curious why you think that crypto can succeed there when all the fintech apps have not been able to succeed there. By the way, what we, what we said just there is, uh, is spot on. Like the other day I, I was using TikTok. I use TikTok a lot. And I, I saw uh, uh, Elon talking about turning Twitter into a super app and make, right. making the exact analogy to, uh, to WeChat. Um, so certainly a very overhyped um, ter terminology. Um, I don't think crypto will be that different from a fintech app, meaning the super app that will succeed is the one that has the most distribution. Uh, right now, that is MetaMask. Uh, MetaMask has uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 million uh, active users. Um, I don't think anywhere, anyone else uh, comes even close to that. And mm -hmm. um, th the reason why MetaMask is different from all the other apps is because if you think about the, the stack, you have uh, the browser extension, which is the ultimate end user facing layer of the stack. Underneath, you have a bunch of apps, right? Like Uniswap, Aave, or whatever, games. Um, whatever, whatever app you want to access as a user, you have to go through MetaMask. So MetaMask is the one that you have to inter interface with all the time. So that's why uh, MetaMask is on top of these apps. And then below the apps, you have the layer one protocols, et cetera. So the, what makes MetaMask and wallets or in uh, user facing wallets different is that they are the, the ultimate aggregator of user experience. No, I think that's, that's what makes the wallets different from, you know, what Jason mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, uh, Robin hood and all these other mobile applications. There's a good, um, I think post by Chris Dixon, uh, or some of the A16Z folks, it says, talks about like, like who, who controls the experience now. So like when you, when you're a user of some of web two apps, like you're kind of beholden to their experience, their data. Now the portability, it lies at the wallet, right? You can move, and pop your like you know you don't have need to have a password you don't need to have an, a user login for every single app you just very quickly use metamask and pop into whatever web3 app you want yeah. um you're at, obviously the DeFi alliance you get to see a lot of startups um do you think that the game is kind of over here for wallets like like metamask as you said in a league of its own uh or do you see perhaps like a game or like an app like step in uh, building their own wallet and just getting a, a ton of yeah. traction. And, and like, I'm trying to think about, we've all like had our like pains with MetaMask, but we still use it. Yep. Uh, and I'm curious if you think that that changes over time. I, I think it can change very quickly. So right now step in has like, despite the bear market, they still have 300,000 data active users, uh, which is, an order of magnitude smaller than, than MetaMask, but you can change at any point in time. Um, Stepin has launched their own marketplace. So Stepin um, went down the super marketplace 
uh, sort of vision instead of the super wallet vision. But they also have their wallet, right? Like the, the Stepan app itself is a wallet, is a Solana wallet. Um, so Stepan can, or any consumer app similar to Stepan can do the super wallet if they wanted to. And matter of fact, uh, we know that uh, I think Uniswap, uh, OpenSea, a bunch of a bunch of similar uh, blue chip uh, decentralized applications are launching their own wallet. So I'm not making this like I'm not trying to imagine or like this is not a, a hypothesis. This is actually a trend I'm seeing right now that that the the, the most used apps uh, in the decentralized world are launching their own wallets. Hmm. Right, so hmm. I guess the last note on the super app, it does the super app kind of reminds me of like when uh, media companies, because I, I, you know, Blockworks, I'm in the media space. When media companies are like, I want to build a, we're building a Bloomberg for crypto. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I, I bet you are. That's the one of the best software companies in the history of the world. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like yeah, it's easier said than done. Uh, it's a, it's a very hard thing to replicate that. But just on your note of um. Everyone, everyone's going to launch their own wallet, Chow. Like, what do you see from this year? Like, let's let's start getting into these wallet wars. Like, do you see? So, Coinbase came out with their own wallet. I think Ledger came out or is coming out with their own wallet. You got to assume someone like the NFT players start coming out with their own wallets too. Like, you got to assume OpenSea instead of OpenSea loses money on the fees, or at least they're not they don't lose money, but they don't capture the value on the fees when you're swapping inside of. Uh, when you're swapping inside of MetaMask there, like that's value that they could capture. Yeah. So you got to assume who who else launches wallets right uh, this year? I feel like everyone is thinking about it. Everyone, everyone, every, everyone, right? Everyone like, who has like at least a million users is thinking about it, if not already working on it. Hmm. So throw out some names like Op OpenSea, you got to imagine rolls one out. Yeah. Um, will the DeFi player, will like someone like a Uniswap, Roll out their own wallet. I think they're doing it. They are right yeah. with the and they're building an app too. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Who Who else do you think is approaching this in different ways? Like Brave comes to mind, right? Uh, I've actually heard really good. Th I don't use the Brave browser or like the Brave wallet, but a lot of people at Blockworks do, and they love it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe can you can you share like so? MetaMask took this approach of like build the wallet first, build this Chrome extension. Brave has taken a different approach, which yeah. is like. Own, own the browser and then but i think really what they're trying to do is like also kind of a super app there yeah. so can you kind of explain like brave's approach to this yeah so again going back to the the layers of the stack um brave is actually part of that picture as well because at the top you have wallets then you have apps you have layer ones um so right now you think that the the wallets own the user experience but actually if you go a level even above, which is the browsers themselves. Now the browser extensions, but the browsers themselves, they can own the browser extensions. They can own the MetaMasks of the world. Hmm. So if they try to, to build their own wallet and uh, within their browsers, and if their browsers are really successful, they're going to own all the power. They're, they're going to become the, 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 the de facto aggregator of uh, experiences. It's, it's all about bargaining power across across the several layers. Like Apple, for example, has a lot of power against all the NFT apps that are in the App Store, right? Like they force them to to pay 100 percent right. to Apple. Apple has a lot of power. If Apple wanted to launch a wallet, it's game over, right? But I don't think they will. Um, but the, the player that sort of sits between the App Store, uh, between Apple and the wallets, uh, is the is the browsers, which is Brave, for example. How, um, what do you think about like the approach that Solana is taking with their phone, um, to, you know, talk about Apple, um, and we had them on talking about, Hey, it's not only like they're building a, a mobile stack that mm -hmm. could integrate with Ethereum and other chains. So do you see that as, as a credible kind of contender, um, could have like blow past like MetaMask and, and the scale that they have today? Yeah. I mean, on paper, the, uh, uh, the thesis behind the Solana phone it is amazing. Uh, it has two parts. One is fighting against the, pow the, the centralization power of App Store. And uh, the other one is um, allowing the users to natively store private keys within the phone. Right. So both um, reasons are very compelling. Now, whether or not they're going to become a real threat to, 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 to Apple, it all boils down to, to execution. 
and I, I have no visibility into how much time they're actually spending on, on this stuff. So hmm. it does feel like, so let, maybe let's extend out the wallets. I, I keep hearing you say this term, which is like wallets are the point of distribution. Like whoever has the distribution wins, whoever has the uh, relationship with the user wins. If you extend that out, you could see a world where instead of building new products, so like previously you used to people who like built new software products, maybe built them for like the desktop or something like that. And then what happened is the the iPhone came out and you you launched directly into hundreds of thousands and then millions of users by just launching on the app store. Yep. So I, do you think that we'll see a world either this year or next year where like you start to see a lot of startups that are just building for the wallet and they launch inside of MetaMask? I, I think it's it's very hard to say, but my, my hunch is it's very hard if you start by building a wallet because you're not going to be very differentiated from MetaMask or other existing incumbent wallets. Um, if you want to win against MetaMask, you have to be 10x better. But how are you going to become 10x better? Like I, I've spoken with a, a, a number of wallet projects uh, that are building like the, the in, in face, end user facing wallets. I just haven't come across anything that makes me think, okay, this is really, really compelling. Phantom was the only compelling one that I've come across over the past year yeah. because it coincided with the rise of Solana. Um, it, it makes sense to me, but I haven't seen anything else. So point being, yeah. if you start by building a wallet, I think it's going to be very hard to compete with incumbents. But if you start by building something that can be immediately useful, it can be any application. It could be a game. It could be, um, I don't know, a, a social network or whatever, right? I just think out loud. If, if the, the, whatever that you're building is immediately useful, that will create the distribution that you need to eventually become a wallet. And that's exactly what, the, what I mentioned earlier about Uniswap and OpenSea. They didn't start as wallets. They start by building something different and immediately useful, then eventually turning into a wallet. I think, okay, so that, that makes sense to me. I think maybe more where I was going though with going with there was um, when you have distribution and you have the relationship with the user over the last couple of years, we've seen that the natural extension of that is to turn, go from a product to a platform. So like Salesforce and Slack are probably good examples of this. Mm -hmm. Slack owns the relationship with like millions of employees all around the world. What they did is they then turned that into, they opened up the API, they turned that into just went from a SaaS product into a platform. Now there are companies that they don't even launch, they, they don't build for non-Slack. They're like, we're building on top of the Slack platform. Mm -hmm. Like Troops AI is a good example. Troops like help sales teams get more powerful. They just got acquired. They got acquired for like 50 to hundred million, I think. And that was like a Slack native application. So could we see tools and companies that are like, we're like maybe MetaMask, could we see MetaMask open up their dev kits and like build much more extensive dev, dev kits and then and companies just go in and build there? They recently did. Um, I can't remember. Uh, I think it's called uh, MetaMask uh, Snippet or I can't remember the name, mm. but they, they open up their, their SDK. Um, and I'm already seeing a couple of projects building uh, for MetaMask. Sorry if, if the name um, is, uh, I, sorry if I, I can't remember the name, but um, the the... There's projects building, for example, what I mentioned earlier about the scam detection within the MetaMask. Oh, snaps. Snaps. Oh, right. interesting. Yeah. Oh, this is cool. Oh, I didn't, I didn't even see this. Oh, bring your features and APIs to MetaMask with snaps. Oh, this is really cool. They did this a couple months ago, I believe, maybe earlier. Um, but uh, basically, huh. it allows third-party developers to build special functionalities, features within the browser extension itself. Hmm. Um. Do you, who do you think is able to compete with MetaMask here? Like, do you think, do you like the Brave approach? Do you like the, um, someone we haven't brought up is Argent as well. Like, do you like the Argent approach? Do you like Phantom's approach? Like, I guess, do you like any of those folks? Or do you think like, what, yeah, maybe I'll start there with that question. I, I, don't, I don't have a strong opinion on this. Um, I, I, I personally find MetaMask really dominant because like that, that just comes from my, my per personal experience, like which Santiago mentioned earlier, despite all the flaws of MetaMask, we all still continue to use it. Um, the, the switching cost is, is way too high. Like the, the switching cost is basically you, you as a user become familiar with, with the user experience and you sort of trust the brand. That, that's pretty much it. Yeah. But the, it's still a very high switching cost. Um, where I think might be, be a, uh, an opportunity for 
other wallets to, to, to disrupt MetaMask is account abstraction, which, by the way, like the, the things that, that disrupt the incumbent is always new technologies that enable new opportunities. And account abstra abstraction might be one of those. So it, mm. it levels the, the playing field for, for everyone um, by allowing people to build, um, to, to let the wallets to interact with uh, smart contracts natively and, and, and do things like, you know, bundle transactions, uh, letting the smart contract handle things uh, for the user instead of letting the user sign every single transaction, right? Like stuff like that. Mm. Uh, it, it's a possibility, but it's not a very strong opinion for me. Hmm. It's it, it's interesting you say that. It does feel like crypto is this unique thing where whenever there's a big new update, like a new uh, uh, implementation on a th on Ethereum or something, it, you you kind of hit reset on the on the competitive landscape, yeah. which gives new up and comers a, a chance at the incumbents. Do you um? Can you actually just explain account abstraction for a second? Because I, I also think like maybe a sub prediction here would be that like the term smart contract wallets will end up being a a major buzzword yeah. um, this year. So can, can you just give an overview of account, uh, account abstraction? I don't have um, a ton of expertise or deep understanding into it. Uh, also, it's something, it's a term I, I keep hearing. Um, <laughs> yeah. and it, My understanding is like, it just makes, the, there are a couple of things it does, which is like, let's say you're LPing into Uniswap. Like when, I, when you do that, there's probably one, two, three there's like four clicks you have to do four transactions you have to approve yep. and one thing this would do is like something like pre-approvals or something like that where like that gets bundled into one transaction yeah that, that's one example yeah um, basically on, on ethereum there, there's two types of account there is um the, the eos and there's the smart contract accounts um before account abstraction uh only the eos basically eos are our accounts you and i like as retail user individual users control like our private keys or whatever um, only, only, only the, the user can sign transactions, but with account abstraction, the smart contracts can do that as well. And uh, uh, by the way, this is a very imprecise definition. I'm just describing the, the very high level. And as a result of that, the wallet itself can become a set of smart contracts that sign transactions on behalf of the user so that the user doesn't have to sign every single transaction, hmm. which you mentioned like earlier, like yeah. with uh, yeah. Uniswap or whatever, it takes four uh, transactions to, to sign, right? So that will yeah. greatly improve um, the user experience for wallet users. If I were building a wallet today, which I have, <laughs> Blockworks is not building a wallet, um, but if we were building a wallet, or if I was building a wallet, we, um, I think probably the two ways to compete would actually be verticalization and geography. Yeah. And what I mean by that is like, um, it's interesting when you travel to other countries because just like, UI UX decisions. I, like whenever I go to a different country, I'm like, oh, this is this is a horrible design. Like this is <laughs> this is awful. But it's awful to me, the American who lives in New York and grew up in San Francisco, to the person in I spent six months in Hungary. Like the UI UX decisions they make in Hungary are very different. Yeah. Um, and actually, I heard you had you had a thesis on this, which was like in America we grew up with abundance, so therefore we like design experiences that are very m clean and like. We, I was going to say modern, but that's our version of modern, like very clean and minimalist. Whereas a version of like in Hungary, they didn't grow up with as much abundance. So maybe they like things that are a little more what yeah. to me feels like, like cluttered. Yeah. Um, but, but, wait, but I think like, yeah, go ahead. This go ties ahead. back to the earlier discussion about super app. Like this is precise. This is one of the best arguments against the super app thesis, which is that the, the WeChat user experience is very much tailored for for, Ch for Chinese people, uh, the WeChat mm -hmm. experience is very cluttered, extremely cluttered. You have a bunch of things within the same app. Um, are you going to see the same thing in America? Maybe not, because the two user segments are, are different. They, they have different user preferences. Yeah. Right. Even, even like WhatsApp for me, I, like, I don't like the WhatsApp UI UX, but like the Americans are not the core, core base of WhatsApp. Um, but, but just like on this, uh, go, go ahead, Santi. Well, I'm just curious, like thinking about, so you're an investor um, and, you know, you, you reference aggregation theory and the decision always comes down to like, where's, I feel like over the last year, people have had very, over monetization of where value accrual happens in crypto is a very hotly debated topic. Um, and I'm curious if you, 
like when you think about wallets and the wallet game, like MetaMask, you know, there's this dude analytic dashboard, for instance. I think they did like this sort of strategy that perhaps is not easily replicable because they were free for such a long time. It's kind of subsidized by consensus. And then they kind of like layered in this ability to swap and people are like, oh, this is great. You know, new product. They already have the distribution base. Uh, and people probably are not realizing that they're getting ripped off in the fees. And, you know, uh, Coinbase had this similar kind of moat, I guess, that it was just kind of the only place where you could trade and develop a really good reputation in the U.S. And they charge you a lot, at least retail. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get at in this question is, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to get at is, you know, my understanding is MetaMask routes the trade to some of these protocols. A lot of it just goes to Uniswap. Some of it uses the Zero X API. These other apps are also benefiting. So mm -hmm. I guess the, the very precise question is, would you rather invest in a new wallet? Would you rather kind of like take a long view on the protocol, the DeFi protocol itself that is going to benefit from all other wallets that are going to route? Like Argent will route to Curve, will route to Uniswap. Um, this more of an open-ended question on, on monetization value accrual. I, I, don't, I don't really place a lot of emphasis on whether the value will accrue to wallets or within the app itself. I, I think it's just something that's so hard to predict that's outside of our, our control. Like this, this is something where I'm even, the, the, my, my best prediction would be like maybe 50%. Like I, I can't be the 50%. So there, there's no way for me to predict where the, the value accrues. Um, so it's not really a factor that, that I look into. Hmm. Maybe let me, how will value accrue though? Like, so MEV, we've had a lot of conversations on MEV on the podcast recently. Yeah. And so like, how do you think, like maybe when you look at wallets, like how will wallets think about MEV? Like, could they, here, here's some examples. They could take MEV and share that with users yeah. as like an incentive to use the wallet or maybe to go like, fee, like fee-less. You could have a fee-less wallet if you offset the cost with MEV that the wallet accrues. Like, how do you think about Maybe not who accrues the most value, but how do you accrue value in a wallet? So exactly, like MEV makes the whole discussion even more complex. Um, and I don't have a strong opinion. Like if you look at the, the whole supply chain of MEV, uh, you start with wallets um, and then um, you have the searchers and then the builders and then finally the validators. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, before and around the time Flashbots um, came about, uh, most of the, the action happens towards, happens towards the end of that chain, right? Around the builders uh, and, and, and the validators. But in, in more recent um, months, we're seeing projects and wallets wanting to move the MEV towards the wallet and, and more towards the, in, in the end user. The wallets want the end user to, to capture some of the MEV. And so it feels like a moving target. It feels like something that, that evolves quite a bit over time. And I don't, I don't really understand what forces are, are driving uh, these changes yet. Um, so mm. I, I can't make a long-term prediction. It's, but I am seeing a trend where MEV is moving towards the wallet. Hmm. Yeah, I think, that, I, th I think so as well. I think, yeah, I agree. I, I, there's a, a business model that crypto people do not like that I think is going to come to wallets as well, which is ads. Um, yeah. I think we'll see a model where something that people don't like use it, like doing is paying fees, especially when gas prices are really high. Right. And um, I think you could see a world where like in the next bull market, two things happen, gas fees, like fees, transaction fees go like skyrocket, but also companies are flush with cash and racing to acquire users. So let's say I'm Coinbase. I'm like, I need to, I've got a billion bucks to go spend on users. I'm going to pay like almost overpay, pay a boatload of money to go uh, advertise inside of the MetaMask wallet and MetaMask can use that ad revenue to offset fees, which then helps them get more users. It's kind of a win-win across the board. There was a company in our last cohort who built exactly this uh, ad network, crypto native ad network. And the reason why it's crypto native is because uh, mainly two reasons. One is uh, this ad network will look at the on-chain activities of the users in order to push them relevant information. 
Mm. Uh, so this is something that was not possible before, uh, before, before crypto. And the other thing that's crypto native is because is that the user themselves can get paid for watching the ads. So this is some this is something that's similar to uh, the Brave, the, the original uh, vision of Brave, right? Um, but uh, because the user has a native wallet, they can get paid for watching the ads uh, natively and quickly. Hmm. And by the way, the company is called uh, Slice. Plug. We love the plug. Um, <laughs> speaking of incentives, Chow, what do you think about tokens? Um, wallets launching tokens. Why should they launch tokens? Because they want to incentivize people to come to use their product. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying they should. Yeah. I just have a feeling that we're going to see a bunch of wallets launch tokens or airdrop, whatever you want to call it. At what point Coinbase like teased with this and then never did? Sorry, uh, not Coinbase, uh, uh, MetaMask. Yeah, I, I remember that too. Isn't it? Isn't there a phantom airdrop on the way? No. I, I think most crypto startups have realized that um, launching tokens too early, using tokens to incentivize user growth too early, pre-product market fit is not a good idea. Um, I have many founders who, who uh, told me this recently. And by the way, I think it's a positive uh, movement. Um, now, I think the mature wallets like MetaMask, uh, it could make sense for them to launch a token if it serves a, some interesting purpose other than just incentivizing users. If the, if the token is designed in such a way that, that accrues value from whatever, like from like, let's say uh, the fees generated from their swap function, I guess it could make, make sense. But where we are today, like th this is not really re related to, to wallets, but more of a macro thing, which is that um, the regulatory scrutiny is probably at its highest uh, in the history of crypto yeah. right now. Doesn't seem like a smart time to be launching tokens. <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah. Um, how do wallets monetize today? Like, how does Santi? You just telegrammed me this um, mm -hmm. this MetaMask revenue thing, and like MetaMask does spit off a boatload of cash flow. Um, how? What is the business model of wallets today? I think it's the swap function. I can't think of anything else. So, the, sorry. The, the, basically, they, they would charge a a fee from the, the swap function. How much how much money are they making, Santi? Well, well oh, I think I, I was trying to infer that, but like last year, like volumes have come down considerably and swap sizes have come down considerably. Yeah. But I think they cranked like two hundred million of revenue or something. Yeah. Like that's... in, in twenty twenty one. Like it was it was just like a, they quickly became one of the most profitable businesses in crypto. Um yeah, like look at this. This is daily to... daily revenue. Like they're spitting yeah. off, they're doing 133,000 and yeah, like 210,000 in daily revenue there. 133, yeah, 91. You run, you run rate that, say they're doing 100K, you know. Oh, here's cumulative this, revenue, 350. Wait, yeah, no. they've done, they're going to do yeah. like 36 million of revenue, which by the way, goes straight to the bottom line, right? They have yeah. no overhead is my understanding. <laughs> It's just like a great business. The other way I've seen wallets like Origin, for instance, well, that I think they monetize, I'm not sure, is kind of through this fee sharing construct, which they might have like these kind of B2B deals with protocols where they might be incentivized to route a particular order. Yeah. Um, and you see mm -hmm. this in traditional finance, finance too. But for the most part, I think the very simple one is, you know, they might quote you, um, well, it depends. So it, it, the swap fee can come in different ways. One is they might quote you something and they might say, look, we're going to guarantee you X price. If we then deliver a lower price, we're going to take that um, and, and pocket the difference. That's a more riskier business model um, than just saying, we're going to just going to charge you whatever 1% at whatever the market price is, which I think is, what MetaMask is doing. They don't take any risk on the execution, right? Other wallets 
I've seen have tried to compete by saying, hey, we're going to guarantee you best price execution. And if we are able to give you a price lower than what we're quoting you, then we'll share some of that or pocket that. Um, which is, I think, what like one inch the aggregator um, has been doing historically. Yeah, I just started playing around with the core wallet. Here, let's see if I can find it. Avalanche, like core wallet, and they just use pair swap. Like they just, uh, yeah, like powered by pair swap. So I think there's all these deals that like there's offshoots of revenue. Um, that flow back into these partnership deals. F uh, funny enough, I'm sharing my screen still because someone just texted me this uh, a link to this. This is a, <laughs> this is a new wallet. I've never heard of this. It's called it's called, it's called Family, I guess, and it's just like like they're clearly trying to compete on just like looking at this video, super clean user experience and mobile, right? Mm -hmm. So. I think we're just going to see so many of these this year. I mean, like, there have about... been so many of these over the past This reminds year. me of Rainbow, actually. I used Rainbow. I like Rainbow a lot. I don't know if you guys have used Rainbow. Um, mobile? Yeah. It's a it's the best mobile ex mobile wallet in my mind. It's very good for like NFTs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's... Uh, I think uh, maybe we can... Like, the things that are perhaps the the biggest areas of opportunity in the wallet space, I think shall curious to get your perspective is like key generation and management, um, which look, I think the value proposition of expecting users to write down 24 words and store them securely is of a different era, you yep. know, uh, and Argent social recovery is really neat. I think, uh, I remember looking at Argent's, uh, series a round which was led by paradigm and i was using argent at the time i was super excited that round i think was priced at like uh i don't know i think like 50 million or something um i think on a relative basis i mean i don't i think they've done super well i really like their product but i think if you look you would have probably it wouldn't have been your best investment because i don't think they've gotten like the traction that you would have thought given all the really cool features that they have. Um, it's just sort of this idea that like crypto is such a small user base that it's hard to like, it, it's hard to like, you're kind of competing for a very small pie and it seems like MetaMask already kind of dominates the crypto nerds that are really comfortable like using it. And so you're just sort of waiting for that mainstream moment where a game comes, a lifestyle app comes and millions of people and say, Oh wow. Like this MetaMask thing is really difficult. I'm just going to go use Argent, but you're still going to go have to acquire those users. So it goes back to the initial question of like, maybe you're better off, like just backing the best app, whether it's a step in like, or a game like that is going to capture the user attention because right now it's really tough. Like I think like, Dharma, I don't you guys remember Dharma? Yeah. Like they had they were acquired like by OpenSea, right? And so they kind of shut shut yeah. down the wallet space. What I'm trying to get out of all this is the wallet space has been very difficult historically to invest as an investable yeah. kind of category. Look look at this look at these two tweets I just found. Look at it just tying into what you just said, Santi. This is I just typed in wallet wars crypto. This is Spencer Noon in 2018. The two biggest battles in crypto, the <laughs> protocol wars, the wallet wars. This is 20, this is four years ago, uh, four and a half years ago. Rick Burton, 2019. There are over a thousand crypto wallets on the market. The wallet wars are going to be fascinating. So, yeah, I mean, like Santu was just talking about. Like, so it's far, there hasn't, there hasn't been really a war because MetaMask has won everything. But um, the, the apps that have acquired over a million users, like the likes of Uniswap and OpenSea, the fact that they're going to launch a wallet. I think that's where the war actually starts. Mm. The folks who already have users and capital on their platform launch launch wallets instead of just like new players who, yeah. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, Chow, anything left on the wall? I do want to just get your take on, before we wrap this up, like other interesting things that you're looking at and spending time on, but any, any like last thoughts on the wallet wars and... 
Um, I mean, I'm just thinking about what you said earlier about um, uh, you know the verticalization and ge geographic focus. I think, like the the people who use MetaMask, um, I think they are very much crypto natives. So there might be a vertical that or user segment that is somewhat underserved, uh, which is the people who are fairly new to crypto and they want to interact with, let's say, games. Let's assume that games or crypto games are going to take off in the next couple of years. Um, I think this user segment may not care that much about security and care more mm -hmm. about um, convenience, uh, easier user onboarding, maybe a Web 2-like user onboarding. And I just can't see one wallet dominating both the crypto natives and those new users. So there, 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 there's probably opportunities for wallets to serve that user segment as well. Do you think that we will see Web2 logins for crypto wallets? Like well, lo login with Gmail? Well, we're already seeing that. Um, there, there's, there's a number of startups building this. Mm. Uh, they're not building an end user facing wallet, but they're build, building SDKs for other wallets and games to integrate with which offers mm. this web 2 like login experience for especially for gamers. So so how that works mm. is um I mean from a user's point of view it's very simple you uh you sign in with your Google or Facebook credentials but then um the um, the private key uh, some of the projects do this way so they they shard the private key into three shards one of the three shards is stored in your local device like your computer from which you play the game uh, another shard is stored by the game developer itself or the wallet itself. And a third shard is stored on a uh, third-party key management service like AWS, uh, KMS, or something like that. And so mm -hmm. you need two of the three shards to sign transactions. And if the user loses their local device, you can always recover the, the private key using the other two shards. And, and by the way, this is... this. I feel like this is very different from the rainbow social recovery, which to mm -hmm. me is back in the day was a really good idea, but I feel like it's not that innovative anymore. To me. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. The, the login and Gmail thing is just making me think like it is how we scale to a billion users. It's against kind of the, ethos of crypto is what I'd say, like pros and cons. Um, but it, man, I don't know. Like when you think about your, like your, your crypto wallet, I think right now is like your home for your assets, like crypto tokens and things like that. Slowly, it's also becoming your home for your NFTs. Like, like, I don't think you can, like the wallet is like really built for, I know you hold NFTs in your wallet, but like, it's really not built for NFTs. It's very like a uh, text-based instead of image-based. Um, but like, I think the next stage is like wallets that are really built for NFTs as well. Then it's like wallets that are built for like everything in crypto. But eventually I think like the end state of a wallet is actually just like your home for all digital goods, like crypto or non-crypto, like just your home for all digital goods, basically. Um, which really is what you're talking about. There is like your identity. It's like the home for your digital identity and having login with Google at the backbone of your entire, I of your entire digital identity is almost just like a shame that, that that's where we're <laughs> that that's like the inevitable case where we're going to end up you know what i'm saying hmm. you think google and apple launch a wallet Chow? um isn't in instagram already almost becoming a wallet by allowing people to to trade NFTs? Not only trade NFTs, but shop for e-commerce e as well. Like you could argue that they're a, a wallet. What is, what is a wallet? The definition of a wallet, I think, is like your access point, um, your store, the place where you store digital goods and where you access other applications in a digital place. Mm -hmm. And so with like that definition, um, I think that Instagram is, is a wallet. Yeah, that's a, I'd never thought about it like that. But you can access e-commerce now. You can access uh, messaging, messaging, e-commerce, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you can order things through the app. You can buy and sell NFTs. Yeah, that's an interesting thesis. Like, I guess it's a it's a really good point that you both bring because maybe that is the way that you display someone like MetaMask, right? Which is you have such a compelling value proposition, a call to action for a user that says, hey, come claim. You're playing a, a, a normal game and you say, uh, I've seen a lot of Web3 games say, look, our go-to-market is going to be, we're going to allow people to not even think about crypto, just play the game. Mm -hmm. Once they accrue enough points, they will have the ability to go be prompted to go to a desktop version that circumvents Apple, like store, and to say, go, go create an account, go claim these tokens. Like that to me feels like the smart approach to acquiring a customer in a very effective manner. But it starts with a, a super compelling product, right? Mm -hmm. um, to then say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go set up, create my account, my keys and what have you, hopefully abstract it away in, in a secure manner. Uh, and that again goes back to the point that I think we were talking about is it start it begins and starts like it begins and ends with like a game or an app lifestyle app yeah. that is prompting you to there's an incentive to go and create a wallet because you know people don't wake up and think about oh okay I'm gonna go you know create ten wallets right yeah. now like it's just like no it doesn't happen that way yeah in other words the the path to success that MetaMask has taken is more of an exception rather than the rule. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Chow, where are you, as we think about wrapping this conversation up, um, you see more startups in crypto than I think anyone in the world. <laughs> more crypto startups. You and Imran and, and the team at Alliance Dow. What, what, are, what, are, what are you seeing that like most people are overlooking just because they aren't interacting with these like early stage founders who are building things that won't be big until probably 2025 or 2026. What are we missing? Um, so there, there's two really important enabling technologies right now. And enabling technologies um, create new opportunities. And these two enabling technologies, one is ZK, the other one is AI. I'm sure many of you have played around with GPT, um, but I think there's gonna be a really interesting really interesting things happening at the intersection of crypto and AI and crypto and, and, and ZK. Um, I, I, I personally understand the AI part more than the ZK part. So I can't really <laughs> envision how, what kind of crypto applications can be enabled by, by ZK. But uh, AI, I think it's gonna be super interesting. Hmm. What L1s are people building on these days? Um, Okay, so here's an alpha that I haven't shared. Um, so since um, FTX collapsed, um, Solana has taken a real hit in terms of developer adoption. And um, th th all the content you see out there is how the DeFi volume has gone down. Like that's very objective information. But what people are probably not seeing yet is um, Solana taking a hit relative to Ethereum and the L2s in terms of developers. Um, where uh, we see increasing developer adoption um, is Ethereum L2s, Arbitrum and Optimism. And mm -hmm. our data shows that very, very clearly since um, November. So on Arbitrum market, and Op... Go ahead, Sandy. I was going to say on a market share basis, um, are you tracking this as projects leaving Solana and moving to Arbitrum or Optimism. Interesting that you didn't say Polygon. Um, or maybe you don't consider that a true tool, but or new projects that haven't deployed it, in any chain. New projects. And going. New okay. projects. The, the developers that are moving, I only have some anecdotal uh, data points. So not big enough to, to draw any conclusions. Mm -hmm. And regarding Polygon, the reason why I didn't say Polygon is because Polygon starts with a very high baseline. Um, so the, the even if there's any improvement, um, it's, it's very hard to see in the data. But Optimism and Arbitrum are starting at a much lower baseline. So improvements are very obvious. Mm -hmm. What Have you seen a particular skew preference of one over the other, or is it kind of 50-50? I would say 50 Between 50. Arbitrum and Optimism. 50-50. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What are some of the, talking about founders and projects that you're working with in the cohort, 
Uh, Because I think you guys are an incubator that works really closely with the founders, like are very engaged. And I've seen that kind of firsthand. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that are are top of mind for founders these days? Um, It's the bear market. Um, It's, you know, Hmm. how much runway runway they should have. Uh, Mm -hmm. When is the best time to go out and, and raise again? What do they do if their traction, their metric, whatever metrics that, that, we, that they track does not improve. And by the way, this is something that, that almost like everyone, like all the VCs, you know, they give advice like uh, you need to have like two years of runway. This is the best time, to, like all these platitudes. The, the one thing that I, I don't see anyone say is that um, in the bear market, what I've seen is that no matter how hard you try as a founder, your metrics are always going to be correlated with the price of Bitcoin. And it's really, really fucking painful. Like no matter what you try, no matter what product features you roll out, not, no matter what growth hacks you roll out, you're going to be at the mercy of the price of Bitcoin. And it's, it's soul crushing. And so the, what I tell our founders is if your metrics are flat over the past year, you are outperforming like 99% of all the startups out there. Yeah, that's a good point. Have you noticed a particular uptick in a, a certain type of application idea vertical recently or over the last year, I guess, if you, you know, maybe DeFi, not so much and more skewed towards gaming or infrastructure or yeah. marketing, like, you know. Um, in the last half a year or so, there's more slightly more ZK, slightly more AI. Um, there's fewer games. Um, a lot more B2B startups. So startups that build products for other crypto startups. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of layer two projects for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms on the human capital, my last question yeah, here is on the, on the human capital side of things. One, how do you measure that? Two, um, what, are, what's, what are some of the trends that you're observing in terms of where people are coming from um, and the quality of, of the, these founders? Yeah. yeah. A year ago, there were a lot of founders coming from AI into crypto. Uh, now there's a lot of founders going from crypto <laughs> back into AI, uh, especially ever since yeah, uh, Shot Kansas Chaser. Um, yeah. On this point, the, do you um, see a convergence? Is it overhyped? Like, is is our is, blockchains a substrate for AI? You know, like it, yeah. it's certainly hype driven. I'm also seeing fewer um, founders coming from big tech these days. Um, there's far more crypto natives, like young evergreen founders, uh, very very strong, very talented, but don't that's, have. That's what I'm seeing too. Is more experience. founders who are like they worked at Coinbase for three years, um, or they like I, I think if you work outside of crypto, like now is a, not usually the time that you get into crypto as a founder. It's like let let me risk it all, start a company which is already super risky, and go into crypto. Which if you haven't gotten into crypto at this point, you probably see it as pretty risky. It's like a lot of the companies now are like they spend honestly there's some second time crypto founders now which is like maybe their first thing didn't work but in in your criteria as yeah. i think of you guys as the y combinator of, of web3 um what are like what maybe give me an example of a team that you kind of took a flyer on and then wildly surpassed or has like surpassed your expectations and I go back to the example of, for instance, the Airbnb guys barely made it to the cohort, uh, I believe. And it was because they were very scrappy in the way that they had sold, like, you know, uh, I was at cereal boxes during the uh, presidential campaign and that impressed Paul Graham and he squeezed them in last minute. But it just, to me, it's like remarkable in the sense that sometimes the best founders really prove themselves over time and initially... It's not very obvious. Sometimes the the more articulate, composed founders are not the best ones. And I'm curious to get your perspective on that mm-hmm. and how you make the filter 
maybe for someone listening out there that wants to apply to to your cohort? I mean, uh, I think fundamentally we look for founders. Our criteria are actually very similar to the criteria of the early days of YC. That is, we're looking for undervalued founders who have the potential to become really, really good. And they tend to be very technical. They tend to think about things from first principles. They may not be very articulate. Uh, they may not be business. They may have. They may not even have the business acumen. But we believe that these are things that we can help them with, because the, the alternatives we look for very strong founders with strong, you know, track record of building previous startups. But these would be the people who can raise from VCs. Why would they? Mm -hmm. Why? Why would we go after them? Right? Want to help the ones that are extremely undervalued. So oftentimes we we accept founders who are similar to, you know, the, you know, the the, the Airbnb, the similar stories uh, with similar stories yeah. to Airbnb founders, right? Um, but the, the key difference between what we're looking for now and what YC is looking for now, at least in terms of crypto companies, is that I really want to see founders think from first principles and understand, or at least can tell me why they're doing crypto. Because um, a lot of them, they look really strong on paper, but they can't explain why they're using crypto as their foundational technology to, do, to build their product. And these are the founders I, one, I think they're building products that may not be that interesting. And two, they, might, they may not have that much conviction into crypto mm -hmm. in the first place. And they probably leave, and by the way, a lot of them are leaving right mm -hmm. now, um, yeah. in, in this year, especially uh, yeah. in the middle of the bear market. This will be my, my last question. I want to, I think you're one of the best thinkers out there. You've been around for such a long time. We're at that point where a lot of people outside of crypto and even within crypto are saying, what's the whole point of this? Like, what are we actually, what are point to me some useful applications that make all of this worthwhile? Or is this just a, a you know, a casino that allows people and provides yeah. great entertainment and speculative value? Is that just it? Like, what do you tell to a, a skeptic, a cynic out there uh, that is really questioning the reason of existence of this industry? Yeah. I mean, uh all the the most vocal critiques i've i've seen and met are those who don't really need crypto in the first place and they are let's say americans uh very wealthy or reasonably well off but if you travel anywhere in south america or southeast asia chances are if you pick a random person in the street and you talk to them chances are they've interacted with usdt and they use USDT as actually an inflation hedge, number one, and two, as a um, payment rail uh, to pay each other. Um, I think stablecoins are actually, have made a lot of impact, positive impact onto the world that most reasonably well-off people in, in the West have not really personally experienced. Yeah. What do you think, uh, I guess as a follow-up, and I'm cheating, I always do this, but say it's the last question, it never is. But what do you think is that, uh, so stablecoins, Trojan horse strategy, people want to hold dollars, you can hold USDC regulated, you feel comfortable perhaps, it's not an endorsement, but you know. Um, what is the next catalyst that, you know, macro aside, that really onboards uh, the next couple million users into the space. I mean, I, I love to say games or social networks, but in the end, I think it's going to be speculation again until, until we reach that saturation point. I think that the first 80% of, uh, of the world that will be onboarded into crypto are going to be onboarded via speculation. And once we've reached that saturation... You know, like chasing the next bonk. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's fine, like using speculation to onboard people into crypto to eventually, to give us time as crypto natives to build actual applications with real utility, like social networks or games or whatever. Um, I think that's, that's a, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Chad, this is, this is awesome, man. Appreciate you sharing the uh, fat wallet thesis and some other, some other interesting thoughts at the end here with us. Um, It'll be interesting to see. I mean, I feel like we've for many years, like the Spencer Noon and Rick Burton post showed us, like we've been talking about the fat wallet 
uh, the, the wallet wars and the fat wallet thesis for a little while now. So it's going to be really interesting to see if this year is the year it plays out. But anyways, man, always love having you on. And, and yeah, thanks again. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. For anyone, I guess, listening out there, uh, when's the next cohort? Um, when can they apply? You're still running it. What's the best way to learn about that process and, and what you're kind of thinking? Best way to find you. I think the deadline for the, to apply to the next cohort is Jan 14 or 13, so a week from now. Um, so um, I think the best way to learn about us is talk to our alumni. Um, mm-hmm. um, and they will tell you amazing things about us. You're not just engineers, for the record. People from all kinds of backgrounds can apply, right? Yep, 100%. Well, appreciate it. Talk to you soon, man. Thanks, guys.